He's got his new program coming out on HBO. We've been talking about it with him for quite some time. Uh, he is joining us here on the Rich Eisen Show as Game Theory with Bomani Jones is right around the corner. It starts streaming on March the 13th. New series on HBO and HBO Max. Bomani Jones, how are you, Bomani? I want to start this with one of my favorite quotes from music that after you guys brought this person up, I have to read. Okay. This is a quote from Miles Davis. I remember one time, it might have been a couple of times, at the Fillmore East in 1970, I was opening for this sorry-ass cat named Steve Miller. <laughs> Steve Miller didn't have bleep going for him, so I'm pissed because I got to open for this non-playing MF just because he had one or two sorry-ass records out. So I would come late, and he would have to go off first, and then we got out there and we smoked the MF plate. Everybody dug it. That is from Miles Davis' autobiography. <laughs> That's some, Jones, some kind of blue right there. Bomani Jones. Do you have his autobiography just around you, or you just you literally have that committed to memory? What is that? I, I, I pulled it up on the computer um, ah. after you mentioned him. But anytime I hear Steve Miller now, that is my immediate thought, is why did Miles Davis do that to him in that autobiography? <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. Uh, congrats in advance of the debut, March 13th debut of your show, Bomani. You will have nothing short of everything to talk about, it seems, like on that program to kick off. Yeah, no. Nah, like, one thing that's interesting is that we'll be doing, like, some big picture stuff. We'll also be getting into, like, the topical um, elements of what's going on out here. But you're right. We picked a good week to come out here because the football world is caught on fire. And that whole Brittany Griner thing is its own amazing situation. Yeah, we got it all in baseball, which somehow could be more interesting by not playing. Yep. I I mean, so there's so much to discuss. And uh, Game Theory with Bomani Jones again on HBO premieres on uh, March 13th. So uh, let's get right into it. What did you think about the trade between Seattle and uh, and Denver? What did you think about Russ now winding up in Denver? Your two cents on that subject. So, you know, when... Detroit traded Stafford to Los Angeles. It was, it was very much a feeling of good for the Lions, right? Like, this guy doesn't want to be there anymore. It's been hard enough. Let's just go ahead and send him somewhere nice, and that's what they did. When Russell and Seattle, it just seemed like everybody was tired of everybody because I would have thought that they could have got more of a package for him than the one that they ultimately got back. And the one they got back wasn't bad, but you compare it like to the Stafford package, I'm not sure that it's the same. And I think most of us would have said that we thought that Russell Wilson was a better quarterback than Matthew Stafford. But see, what I wanted to hear for the Broncos, just because so many people stay good, really old, doesn't mean that everybody's going to do that. And so Russell Wilson is 33 years old and has taken 40, 45 sacks a year since he got into the league 10 years ago. I don't know for how much longer he's going to be a guy that you can expect to play elite level quarterback. So you would not have taken that shot that Denver took. Well, I think if I'm Denver, I take the shot because it's the best chance that you're going to have. Like everybody gets, gets a bit handcuffed when you're in a year where there's no good quarterback in the draft, right? Where there's nobody in the draft that anybody seems to have real enthusiasm about. So then it's like, well, where do you go to find a quarterback? Good quarterbacks are typically not available. Like, I would even, if I'm on the phone with Seattle while this happened, given that Seattle is still trying to do something to win now, I'm really skeptical as to why it is this thing is for sale. What, just because he wants to be traded? What's that got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's the ultimate mystery, Bomani, Um, and that one I still can't get a straight answer about. Even even privately, um, people, if you will, close to the situation – do not talk about it. It's like Fight Club or Third Rail, whatever you want to say is, why did Russell Wilson have to go? Why did he want to go? Why did this marriage get dissolved? What happened here? I don't get it. Well, you know? the front office doesn't seem to like him very much. Like he, he, he doesn't seem to elicit the warm and fuzzies from the people who are around him. And the things that we heard about the way Richard Sherman and those guys looked at him, it doesn't sound like those guys necessarily liked him. That's not to say that he's a bad leader because he might have been good at leading them. But he doesn't – one thing about Russell Wilson, if you've ever talked to him, and I, I imagine you guys have had the pleasure of him not answering your questions <laughs> on your radio show. Like I've had the pleasure of him not answering my questions on my radio show. 
And when he doesn't answer your questions on a radio show, it's not like he tries to be slick about it. Right. Like he'll laugh to acknowledge, wow, what a great question that I would answer if I wasn't Russell Wilson. <laughs> and then he just starts talking about something else. Like I don't know how many people in his actual life like really know that dude because anytime we wind up around him or we see him, he's giving a projection of what Russell Wilson quarterback is supposed to be. And I don't know how well that works when you're actually dealing with people every day, like especially with the type of personalities they used to have on that team, the kind of personality that Pete Carroll is. But I am floored that a team that still thinks it has a chance to win now, whether that's true or not is its own discussion, but if they think they have a chance to win now and they traded a Hall of Fame quarterback away, wow. Or they just figured that they didn't have a chance to win right now and that without a first-round selection this year, this is their best chance to reset and better to do it now than try and run back what they did last year. That may be it too, Bomani, you know? Yeah, it could. And I want to see what quarterback they ultimately wind up with because that's when Russell Wilson is going to get really mad about this. Like if he looks up and they think, fine, we'll just go get Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh, man, I'd be ready to fire something down. Like what what exactly is it that you're trying to say about me? And so I just don't know what option there is for them to land. Like, I am actually talking myself into the idea that Mitchell Trubisky is going to be a good option for somebody. I'm really getting to that point. I don't feel great about it, but I got an argument. But if they, they ain't going to win nothing if they got Mitchell Trubisky. Bomani Jones here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, about five minutes before you joined, um, Carson Wentz was acquired by the Washington Commanders. He's back in the NFC East. He's now a twice-traded quarterback um, who had a season last year that put the Colts in position to be kind of like the Niners, that proverbial team you didn't want to see, but then they fell flat. He got COVID. He wasn't vaccinated. He got COVID um, at a time when it appeared it didn't really matter if you were vaxxed or not. But I just bring that up because that is something that's stuck in the craw of the Colts um, and it's stuck in the craw of the Cowboys with, uh, you know, Amari Cooper, putting it all together, though, that's my long wind-up by saying uh, Wentz, to me, doesn't appear to be that big swing quarterback that Washington Commander fans were hopeful for. I wonder what your thought is on that subject. I'm just amazed that people keep talking themselves into him. Like, that year that he had, uh, the, the year before last, the 2020 season, was an all-time terrible year for a quarterback. Very few quarterbacks ever get a chance to start again after playing that poorly, let alone somebody trade a first-round pick to get you. Then somebody else, after you don't come through it and matters at the end of that season, still talking yourselves into this 29-year-old quarterback that doesn't even necessarily um, relate that well to people and whose team didn't necessarily like him that much when he was in Philadelphia. And that's just what's so wild to me about this is I understand that there's a quarterback scarcity, but – why do you think that this guy is something different than what he's demonstrated himself to be? And so let's say he's in the same camp as Garoppolo, which is something that you could make an argument for after the way it ended last year. Like I heard you right before I came on, and you were saying with him, he was good until he wasn't. And there's some guys, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kirk Cousins, Carson Wentz, there's always going to be until he wasn't. That moment is always going to come up. Do you want a quarterback where you know in the end he's going to be the one to mess it up? Hmm. What about the Rodgers re-signing? What do you think now that we've – and it's amazing. His, his re-signing, Bomani Jones, uh, was front-page news, if you will, uh, top of the uh, uh, news stack news, uh, top of our Twitter feed news for about 90 minutes until the, the um, Wilson trade came in. And we've been waiting two years to find out how Rodgers' long-term uh, future would be decided for Green Bay. We finally have it. He's staying put. The one thing I want to give Aaron Rodgers credit for, and he's done a lot of kooky things in the course of the past few months, but I appreciated the fact that when it wasn't going well with the Packers, and he said it wasn't going well, when it got better, he acknowledged that it was getting better and gave credit to everybody for actually putting in work for it to get better. Like, I actually think that for all the things that there's room to slam Aaron Rodgers for, the way that he handled his relationship with the Packers and its ultimate resolution actually made him look pretty good in the situation because he could have come and acted a donkey when he showed up this year to make sure that he got out and he did and they made it work now 
the counterpoint on this, I can't remember if I've given this hot take on this show. It's a bit <laughs> theoretical, but I think it has a place. All right. You have the floor. If you play your home games in a stadium that is an icebox in January, I'm not sure a pass-heavy approach is the smartest way to play. Right? Like you remember in baseball in the 80s when Bush Stadium in St. Louis was like 414 to deep center and it was a cavern. And so they said, fine, they just got a bunch of dudes slap the ball around on AstroTurf and run really fast because you were never <laughs> going to win there playing, like trying to hit a bunch of home runs. And I feel like the passing revolution in the NFL makes a lot of sense in the regular season. And then you forget that games are played outdoors in January in a lot of places. And so I've always wondered with, with him, and even to a degree, Brett Favre, as it went on with him in his career, is there a home field disadvantage to building everything around the quarterback if you're going to play in Green Bay? Everybody else that plays that far north got a dome. Like, half your division got domes, except for you old-timey teams that think there's something cool about playing in frostbite. <laughs> well, I, I, I – have heard this before, not from you though, so I'll just respond by saying I totally get it and I understand it and I would agree with it as a uh, an indication of the future possibilities and successes of Aaron Rodgers, if not for the fact that AJ Dillon was a, was drafted and he's the he's the guy that you're supposed to roll down the frozen tundra lane to knock the the pins out of your opponent in in a playoff game like this one against San Francisco, and he got hurt. So it's not like he was there and they went away or Rodgers audibled right. out of it. They had the guy, and they had it set up. But the once again, we're, we're left wondering the why and what happened with Rodgers leading a team. You know, like, so I totally understand it. I'm, I guess I need to see it run back one more time before I can say – You've 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 hit the nail directly on the head, but you're definitely oh, no, around. And the, I will say this: Yeah, if you got the option, you go with Aaron Rodgers. You know what I mean? Like, right. like it's like if this is the play you make, and honestly, special teams is what did it in this time. And you know, no matter what kind of leader we think Aaron Rodgers is, we don't expect him to lead special teams too. Like they don't pay him that much money. Um, and so, you, I mean, he's definitely the play, and that offense is definitely built for them to run the ball if they need to. But I think that all these teams are going to need to really reconsider. When this gets late, man, there's a reason why you just pound teams. It still works. I swear it does. Bomani Jones here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. So uh, what uh, what do you want folks to know about game theory? What's it going to look like? Who's your first guest? Walk me through the rundown for the show. Man, I keep, I keep forgetting to ask people if I'm allowed to to say the particulars of it, because I think they're going to release it. So I can tell you this. I can't okay. tell you who the first guest is, but I can tell you it is legitimately one of the biggest names in sports. And not an athlete, but one of the biggest names in sports. And we are premiering on Selection Sunday, and we are going to do a fantastic piece that is commemorating a very important figure in the history of college basketball. And I say to watch this, because this show is really going to be fun. Like, I'm in a situation where they really gave me the keys and said, we're going to put together the show that you want. So, like, if you've seen me on television in the last however many years, through no fault of anybody else's, but by and large, it's me on a show that's built to exist outside of me. This is me on a show that is built absolutely for me. Like, we got a great team of writers. we got a great team of producers. And this is the most creative thing that I have ever done. Like, I've spent the better part of however many months just kind of sitting around and coming up with stuff and figuring out, like, so if I was doing a podcast segment about this, now we can take it to the next level because we got a field team that can go out and shoot something that's surrounded that. And I got other really smart, brilliant people that can look at what I said and be like, hey, well, what about this? Well, maybe we can add that and everything else. So, like, stuff I've done before was probably limited by my brain. Now we're expanding outside of all of that. And we did a test show couple weeks ago and the biggest compliment that we got from the executives really was this feels like a show that's supposed to be on hbo well then congratulations like, i don't know how good no. you, i say this i don't know how good episode two gonna be but i can tell you episode one gonna be a smoker well i, <laughs> I, I love it bomani and and i say congratulations in advance without even seeing it because way back in the day one of uh a few agents ago uh one of my agents said to me at the time what do you want out of your career? Like, what, what, what is exactly you want out of your career? And I thought it was a trick question. 
And he's like, the one thing that you can have out of your career is what? And, you know, I say longevity, money, you know, whatever. And, you know, I said, finally, uncle, what is it? And he said, the ability to choose your own assignments, because everything else comes from that. And for you to be able to be set up the way that you are set up on HBO is terrific. I mean, that's a rarity in our business. And, um, you know, uh, one of the producers, Adam McKay, I mean, he couldn't be more smart and successful and, you know, obviously big time. So in advance, I say congrats, and I can't wait to see what you're cooking up. Look, yeah. man, I appreciate it. Nina Collins is kind enough to send me a picture. They have put an advertisement up for this show at the Beverly Center. Like, oh, okay, that's what we're doing. That's here. it. Like, every now and then there's a moment where I'm like, oh, this is legit. We sat down for the test show, and it's like, and action. And the from HBO came up, and I wasn't expecting that. And I was like, yeah. almost had to stop down. Like, I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> You got to stop down, huh? I would. I, I don't blame you. That's pretty cool, Bamani. Yeah. That is great. Uh, so when the six-episode uh, run ends on April 17th, what Lakers team will be uh, taking the floor <laughs> around then, do you think? <laughs> Man, like, who, who's still going to want to feel like doing this? Like, one of the worst things for them in this situation is that Russell Westbrook is a man of character. And when I say that, I mean, they would probably love to, like, send him home, but that man is not the man that's going to go and let you, like, to steal paychecks. That's not him. I, he's one of my favorite players ever because nobody goes as hard as him. But I've always said part of why he's one of my favorite players is I've never rooted for his team. Like, the consequences and results of his play have never mattered to me. I just appreciate the ethos that's behind it. But they – they have such problems because it goes so far beyond Russell Westbrook because the truth of the matter is you shouldn't make your player the man in charge of the whole operation. And I just think they've given LeBron too much power, and this team they have is one that I don't think can win a championship and I don't think can get better. And so what was a poorly run organization is now a poorly run organization that seems to be one faction being the star player and his agency that represents six players on the team. And on the other side, all the people who have been there forever and kind of resent it. So, uh, boiling it all down, uh, getting set to be the away team in their own arena in a play-in game? Is that basically what you're saying I mean, right now? Can you think of – I can't think of anything more embarrassing <laughs> than if the Lakers were to lose a play-in game to the Clippers without Paul George and without Kawhi Leonard at their own house to miss the entire playoffs. Like – I just experienced the exhilarating joy of Duke losing Coach K's last game against Carolina at home. Couldn't have been better. Couldn't have been better. This is like the only thing I can imagine being like halfway close to it, but for a different reason. Not because it's a rivalry, but the idea that the Lakers is embarrassing enough that you've got to play in this contrivance just to get in, and you might lose at your own house to the Clippers? That would be the debut of the sequel, Firing Time, on HBO, right? <laughs> yeah, Frank Vogel's just got to be like, look, man, I, I don't know what else I can do. There's nothing, it, nobody thinks this is his fault. Everybody thinks he should be fired. That's what a guaranteed contract does. Like, hey, okay. <laughs> that is a perfect way to say it. Everybody thinks it's not his fault, but everybody thinks that she should still be fired. That is an unfortunate spot to be in as an HC anywhere. The, the money guaranteed, though. I wish somebody would fire me for guaranteed money. <laughs> yeah, so uh, hey, what's the, uh, before we let uh, Bomani Jones go, go ahead and hit him. Uh, on yeah, the Bo, uh, we're the same age. TJ here, we're big music fans. As you know, it's the 25th anniversary today of the Notorious B.I.G.'s death. If you just could just speak on his cultural significance still to this day, maybe what's your favorite song, favorite lyric, etc. cetera. Uh, I know it's probably really important to you. I think the biggest thing that I'll always remember is that morning that I found out. I can't remember if that was the 9th or the 10th, but I was on the way to work. I was busting tables at the Fud Ruggers at Willowbrook Mall, and the news came over that Biggie had died. And I was 16, but I remember, man, I was that hit me really hard. But part of why it hit me really hard was this is like six months after Tupac had died, and it all felt like a fait accompli in a way that was just hurtful, right? And it just felt like like everything just felt like such chaos because this dude was the coldest. Like in terms of just the ability to manipulate words and make sounds out of it and everything else, he was so good and managed to become like supremely famous largely on the strength 
of just being so good. But if you want best lyrics, they're probably all in victory. The first verse of victory is like one of the most amazing pieces of writing that anybody has ever done. And also, I'm kind of doing it like this because most of my favorite Biggie lines are not appropriate for the federal <laughs> commission. That's the TV, what the uh, the TV mature seventeen rating that you're going to see on HBO. Yeah. Maybe I got you. Hey, congrats yeah. again on your show. Uh, let's uh, let's do this again uh, very soon. I always enjoy when you call in and have a and have a chat. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, man. I'll talk to you soon. You got it. March thirteenth on HBO, streaming on HBO Max. Game Theory with Bomani Jones. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here. 